Good morning, everyone, and welcome back. We hope you all had a happy and healthy holidays. Um, as uh, usual, you can use the chat feature on Zoom to post any questions that you have for Dr. Eiler, and he will address them, <clears throat> excuse me, at the end of his presentation. Uh, so Dr. Eiler, <clears throat> no pressure, but we're hoping you have some good news for us. Thanks, Vicki. Thanks, everybody, for coming. I want to thank Chabin and Kaiser Marston for continuing to sponsor this. So I'm going to start basically from where a lot of people are concerned about, and that's the forecast. Now, one of the things about the latest national level forecast we have is it's from November. But in November, we kind of knew the tea leaves to a certain extent. We knew Omicron was here. We knew that the president was not going to get the larger spending package done. And what that did was it changed the way economists or macroeconomists were seeing the future in terms of the next few quarters, and but maybe not the next few years, and we'll see that in just a minute. So the three variables we're gonna look at are real GDP or, or income after inflation and the percentage growth on an annualized basis. And that shaded column there is next door to an unshaded column, which says previous over it. That was the previous quarter's forecast from, uh, from August. So. Looking forward, you can see that the first few quarters of this forecast, the last quarter of 2021, which we should be getting some data on this week or early next in respect to the first estimate of GDP growth. But you can see how it's faded in the forecast for the first couple of quarters of 2022 and then picks up at the end of the year. A lot of that fade from the previous quarter was because we did not get that larger spending package through. And the supposition was that Omicron was going to have some detrimental impacts on growth. And we've seen that in the high frequency data we're following with respect to labor markets and the flow of goods and services. The unemployment rate continues to outpace forecasts, but there's a caveat to our jobs growth numbers. The caveat, if you're using the unemployment rate in sort of its classic headline form as a measure of labor markets, is that if people are exiting the labor market, and those people would have been unemployed anyway, it reduces the labor force and the unemployment rate, or the unemployed, the numerator and the denominator are moving down simultaneously. So if you think about what's left in the labor force as being those that are employed, the percentage of the labor force that's unemployed, which is the measurement that we know is the unemployment rate, is going to shrink a little bit more rapidly. So whether or not this is a function of job growth or it's a function of the shifting in the labor force is still an open question and, and economists are scrambling to try to make sure that they understand which one is which. But we'll talk more about that later. Inflation is the kind of hot macro topic of the day. The supposition is that 2022 will be a transition year for the most recent inflation spike we've seen in the United States. And I'll talk a little bit more in detail about this in just a second. But over the next few quarters, we should see it at least start to slowly fade. Now, there's two angles on that slow fade. One is that uh, uh, forecasters were initially thinking that we would see a fade because we would have supply chain issues resolved to a certain extent in 2022, but we would still have demand pressure in the economy pushing prices up. So the, sort of in a sense, if you think about inflation as always a phenomenon of excess demand, if demand is rising and supply is contracting simultaneously, if supply goes up, but demand remains relatively elevated, there's still gonna be some inflation pressure. So you notice that the inflation forecast, the shaded column under core PC inflation, which I'll talk more about in a minute, is higher across the board for the next few quarters and also for the next few years that we'll see in a second. But the idea is that at least is fading from its recent heights. Over the next few years, growth is still looking very robust. So economists right now are not forecasting any recession for the next few years, which is good. Just basically getting back to pre-pandemic growth after we continue to grow out of the hole that was dug in 2020. Unemployment continues to move down. And in fact, we very much beat these numbers. We're already basically at 4.1 percent rather than seeing that at year end 2022. So we're probably going to be under 4% uh, later this summer and kind of cruising in the three and a half to 4% over the next couple of years. Again, that presumes we will not see a big influx of labor force come back in that's suddenly looking for work. But if that's true, we should see that demand soaked up relatively quickly. And then inflation is heightened from where it was from a forecaster standpoint in the previous quarter, but then again, kind of settling at a pre-pandemic pre normal. Now, let's look at the jobs market briefly at the US level. These data are from the beginning of January to reflect what happened in December. 
I'm comparing it to the Great Recession. So if you start the Great Recession in November 2007, it took about 80 months to get back to where we started with the Great Recession. So that whole dug in the labor market from the Great Recession took about 80, minute, 80 months to resolve. This is the evolution of the COVID-19 recession and where we are by the end of December. 97.8% back to where we started January 2020. We got to get that black line above the red dotted line just to recover the jobs that were lost. One of the biggest concerns for economists with respect to the job losses created by the recession from the pandemic is what will be potential reallocations within the industry composition in the United States as a result of the job losses because some industries were hit harder than others. Well, if we look at what's happened, the original cuts in April 2020 when the pandemic recession really started in earnest were across the board every sector. In May, there was a little bit of recovery here and there, but some other industries took a little bit bigger hit. You can see that uh, natural resources, which is categorically mining and logging on this graph and hotels, accommodation, both sunk a little further. But by December 2020, we'd seen recovery. And by the end of last year, we'd seen it come back pretty good. So this is the shifts in industrial composition of jobs as a result of the recession. And you'll notice that transportation and warehousing, finance, and professional services have basically recovered or actually seen pretty decent growth since January 2020. Thinking of January 2020 as the beginning of the problems in the labor market and as a benchmark just to get back to a recovered state. But if you look at the far right-hand side, food services and drinking places, basically bars, restaurants, and places where you serve food, have still are still about 5% below where we were before the recession and accommodation, hotels, motels, and anywhere you stay overnight down just under 15%. So there's still some harm in those personal services, sort of, you know, quasi retail style jobs across the United States, even though we've seen recovery, the supposition is that there'll be a little bit of a tail effect from a micron and we'll see how far that goes. But the biggest workforce development concern within these data, or what do we do with those workers that were working in hotels, motels, bars and restaurants before, and to a certain extent, event centers are mixed in there too, before the recession, if those jobs do not come back and are there, is there going to be structural change on the other side of this lingering into the rest of this decade? Let's break down inflation a little bit more completely. So I showed you before the forecast for these data here, which is called core personal consumption expenditures prices. This is the broadest based price index that we follow in the United States. A lot of other advanced countries do, it also, do also a so-called core PCE index for prices. But the idea here is to give you a little bit of history, show you how the shape of the forecast we saw before is meant to play out and then give you some perspective. So you'll notice that basically once the Great Recession started and evolved to its end point and bottom, that's that first shaded area moving left to right, the wide shaded area. You see, we kind of cruised under 2% inflation and really significantly under 2% inflation for a lot of the last decade. And we got very used to having relatively slow and low moving inflation. Then this recession hit, that's that skinny shaded area on, the, on about two thirds moving left to right. You can see that there. And that was how quick the last recession took place. But then once the supply chain issues really started to seize up at the same time that we started to buy goods and services and started to travel a little bit more, prices started to rise again. And that significant rise is a little deceiving. It's not that there's price increases across the board. A lot of this was in housing prices, car prices, and broader services. But also, and this is something I should tell you, is that core means that you take out food and energy prices. The problem with doing that, even though the supposition is you do that because food and energy prices tend to be a little bit more volatile, a little bit more deceiving in that volatility, and they tend to have short-term volatility, is that the longer those food and energy prices linger at relatively high levels, they start to seep into other supply chains and then start to affect a lot of the, uh, the, the large proportion of the core PC index. So economists are concerned that if we don't see this fade, which I'm now gonna shade, that forecasted fade take place, we're going to run at relatively hot inflation, maybe for another 12 or 18 months. However, there's a lot of back and forth within forecaster circles about whether or not the tea leaves are telling us, based on the data, that we are starting to turn the corner a little bit, but how hard we're going to turn it and how long it's going to take to get that fade following those red dots is really the open question. And there's a relatively large margin of error with respect to how we're going to fade. 
the two biggest issues with inflation is that it erodes real incomes and real returns on assets. So how much increasing prices will then start to affect demand and start to slow our economy down is really the next play. But let's just break it down real quick. What are we watching? Are we seeing prices falling or stabilizing? That's critical to feel like we're actually turning this corner. Will the Federal Reserve increase rates quickly? So when you think about the Federal Reserve, we'll talk a little bit about the Fed in a minute. If the Federal Reserve is talking about increasing rates significantly in 2022. How much is that uh, signal that they believe demand is really what's driving inflation rates, not supply? Policy cannot address supply issues very quickly in terms of monetary policy. In fact, it can lead to a lot of problems if the supply side of the economy is the key reason why we're seeing inflation. Our wages going to continue to rise. So one of the other pieces of this is that as those prices continue to rise, including food and energy, they start to affect worker decisions about taking jobs and whether or not they're going to take jobs at the current wages offered with respect to what they're seeing with respect to cost of living. So if those two don't mesh up, wages might have to continue to rise just to draw people into the workforce or to simply satiate worker demands for folks that you already have working for you because cost of living is going up. And how much higher are prices of housing go? So if you think about what's happened in the, uh, the price of homes to buy, and we'll talk about these data toward the end in about 10 minutes, the housing prices rising lead to a little bit more local pressure on cost of living. So how wages are affected does depend on the local housing market, including rental prices. And so we're watching those closely to try to figure out whether or not there's gonna be more pressure on wages in pockets, specifically around California, as prices shift and continue to have pressure to rise. But how much higher can they possibly go? Well, I'll tell you more about that in a minute. And right now, the forecast for housing prices is good, at least for one more year. The problem with that is that it leads to a little bit more of distance to make for folks that are at lower middle incomes that are trying to move out of rental and into home ownership. And that can lead to more political pressure around housing. The key for policymakers is can we decompose the effects? Like I said before, the Federal Reserve is talking a lot about increasing rates relatively quickly in 2022. They have to make sure demand is what's driving this versus supply. So we're watching for those supply side fades in terms of getting our supply chains back together, but there's still a lot of global consternation about whether or not that's gonna take place in 2022 or not. These data are from November. Our equity markets look like this. And so something I wanted to give some perspective on, January has been a pretty tough month on equities so far. But if you look at what's happened over the last 20 years, you can see the previous two recessions are the two shaded areas moving left to right. The COVID-19 recession is the one on the far right, very short-lived, that very sharp downturn in the S&P 500, followed by this basically almost vertical climb up to the top where we're at right now. And then you can see, I'm going to highlight this. That's that little twist that's taken place the last couple of weeks. So people are starting to freak out about, okay, is this the end of the ball game? Is there a speculative bubble in assets? Well, if you look at what's happened, is specifically over the last 20 months, much less the last 20 years, there's been amazing returns to the market on average. So if we do have a little bit of a downturn, some of that could be profit taking, some of it could be heightened risk, some of it could be the idea that, uh, that the tech companies are a little bit overblown in terms of prices. We have to expect there's gonna be some flattening of that growth rate. But the reason why it's starting to flatten is actually is very critical because the supposition that that run up might be more about speculation than fundamental value is something that the Federal Reserve is also looking at because they know increasing rates can put downward pressure on equity markets. So all that is sifting around in terms of policymakers and also the way investors are looking at portfolios. Let's now turn and look at California. Here's the labor market situation in California, similar to what we looked at with the, with the national level. This is the Great Recession. It took about 72 months for California to go from the beginnings of the Great Recession to where we actually recovered the same number of workers that we started with right before the Great Recession. And this is the COVID-19 recession as of the end of December. So we just got these data last Friday. We're fit 95.8% back to where we started in January 2020 with the Great Recession, I'm sorry, with the COVID-19 recession. You'll notice that it's been this sort of slow, smooth movement up toward that red dotted line for California. We got to get over that dotted line to feel like we've just recovered. This is the industrial composition of change. So just like we looked at it with the US, one of the biggest concerns about California is, okay, we recover those jobs. We get that black line over the red dotted line. What's that mean industrially? Where are the shifts? Are there people who are displaced in a structural way because the jobs that were in their industry are not coming back? 
Well, this is April 2020 and May 2020, kind of the same story that we saw at the national level. December, we saw some recovery, especially in transportation and warehousing, which we kind of knew because we shifted our lives online. And here's September 2021, October, November, and then finally December. Boom, there we go. Notice that just like the US, we saw recovery in transportation utilities. We actually have basically re retail recovery, which is kind of amazing if you think about it. But a lot of that's because we got out of the house and people are actually going back to brick and mortar to a certain extent for now, but be cautious on that. Far right hand side is another reflection on where some real pain exists. Leisure and hospitality, other services, so hair salons, nail salons, hotels, motels, bars and restaurants still down, government down 5.3%. That's concerning in the sense how much of that is retirement, how much of that is outbound migration, and what's that mean for the potential inefficiency or lack thereof in government services, not now, but three, four years from now. Otherwise, still kind of lingering negative numbers across the board, constructions up in California, but we kind of knew that was going to happen because it was declared an essential service. The one really kind of mystery land is in retail. But generally speaking, we know that folks that had jobs in bars, restaurants, and hotels and motels have shifted toward transportation, warehousing, the sprinkle of retail, a sprinkle of construction, a little bit in manufacturing. The key is how much of those jobs are still in California, sorry, those workers are still in California or have they left? And what does that mean for workforce development over the next few years? I'll talk more about that in a minute. Here's a forecast for where workers are going to go. So when the governor's budget came out on January 10th, the Department of Finance forecasts the next four years as a way of informing that budget and where things might be going. Let me now add the last two recessions to this. So these data are quarterly from 2005, actually through, believe it or not, the forecast goes all the way through the end of 2025 now. And this forecasted area after recovery looks like this. So the supposition is that the hardcore job cuts, and look how far those job cuts went in the second gray shaded area, that skinny portion, which is the COVID-19 recession, went down actually below the volume of workers that were there at the bottom of the Great Recession. So that's how hard the cut was in California. Then up the ladder, we went relatively quickly, but the belief is that we're actually gonna cross that red line somewhere later this year. And the data I showed you before also suggests that. The key is how we advance forward. So the supposition is we will see consistent job growth throughout the remainder of this first half of the 2020s after the end of this year, but it's increasing at a decreasing rate. Part of that's because the jobs demand are there and we should see incomes rising and, and employers wanting to continue to hire people, but will the workers be there? So one of the real frictions inside the, the Department of Finance, I'm actually part of the final team that comes in with the Department of Finance that are, are regional economists around California to help shape this final forecast. It's very humbling because there's a lot of work that goes into this and it's just crazy how many angles there are. Bottom line is, is that the, the availability of labor force and the actual growth of jobs is one of those real argument points for economists right now with respect to California's future. Part of that's because we've seen housing prices grow. So I'm gonna show you a sample of what's happened from places around California and the state on average. So the state on average over the last 12 months has, at least right now it's, it's being estimated that there's been a median home price growth of about 20%. So that's an amazing 12 month growth rate. Now it's not unprecedented, but it's still relatively strong, especially on the heels of recession. And here's the last 24 months, which is even more robust. You can see San Francisco only grew 10%, but that was actually after it fell as a result of the recession. Butte County, which, were, which is a place similar to Sonoma and Napa counties and also Ventura County in California, where we've seen relatively strong fire activity over the last few years, also grew at a slightly slower rate. But over the last 24 months, most of these major counties in California have seen relatively significant housing price growth. Now, the positive of that, if you're a homeowner, that's super. If you're not a homeowner, it might drive you to really think about how long you can stay in California, which then can start to affect workforce. And this is why you're going to start hearing rumblings out of the governor's office about the frictions involved with how labor and housing have to match up to have consistent labor force. Here's the home price forecast. So I told you before that the forecast looks relatively robust. California is being forecasted right now to get about 14% growth over the next 12 months, basically for 2022. 
from Merced, or sorry, Madera and Merced, which are relatively high, a little bit higher than the state on average, all the way down to where Tehama County is still at 7.7% increase, which is still really good growth. So especially two years out from recession, folks, this, these are amazing continued forecasts, but all the conditions are there. High, high income jobs remaining in place, relatively low interest rates, and um, potentially you know, having people putting up existing units, there's very little supply. So once again, if demand exceeds supply, you're gonna have inflation and there's, here's the picture of housing price inflation right there. One of the things that's concerning though is what's happening with workforce. And the next few slides to wrap up are gonna be workforce focused. For the first time in the Department of Finance is recording what happens with the changes of population in California, we actually are having an estimate of a lower population in the last fiscal year. So this is from July to June. This is births and deaths in California. And then here is foreign migration in net. So over the last 20 years, we've seen more people coming in from the outside the country coming to California than leaving California for other countries. But it's the domestic migration that's been the most focused, especially during COVID-19. So these are people that have left the state of California in net, inbounds versus outbounds, so negative. And negative pretty much across this entire 20-year span. The problem is you mix all these data together, and for the last fiscal year, the population of California is estimated to have actually fallen by a little bit. Now, if you think about that and you think about that spread across the counties of California, where have people left and where, where, what counties have seen the most movement of people out or in? So Butte County, which is still reeling from the 2018 campfire, 4.8% down, but all the way up to places like San Benito County, which is connected to Santa Clara County, up about 1.3. So this is just for the last fiscal year in California. So June, July 1, 2020 to June 30, 2021 are the latest estimates. This is the California change on average that we just saw in the last graph as a percentage change. You can see all those counties on the left-hand side lost population. But what we don't know yet, and this is something we're gonna have to see with the census data and some other data is connecting where people were to where they went. So we don't have those data. We don't know how many people left Santa Clara County and moved to places like Alpine County. We don't know how many people left Los Angeles and went some other place in California, maybe Sacramento, maybe Shasta County. Right now, all those kind of data are unknown, but we know that there's been movements. Now, again, that affects local labor force. To end our data, stream here on a note to really be thinking about. This is the forecast of high school graduations. So the number of new high school graduates in each county, places like Glen County up almost a quarter over this decade. So this is from 2020 to 2030, basically. But a lot of places in California seeing negative growth or a reduction in the number of high school graduates. Now, why that's important? Again, think about new entrants into the labor force. Where do they come from? They either come from inbound new residents, or new high school graduates, generally speaking. So if you're losing high school graduates, you're gonna be much more dependent on surrounding areas or inbound population. And the more counties that are seeing reduced high school graduates become much more dependent on imported labor. You're not in a sense generating labor indigenously with respect to your population and having working families grow up to continue to work in that area. But places like Glen and Sutter County, pretty good growth. Smaller places, as you see on the far right-hand side, with respect to places like Amador and Sierra County, pretty low. But if you look at the far right-hand side, look at some of the names starting to creep from right to left. Santa Clara, Orange, Los Angeles, San Mateo, San Francisco, and some of the other uh, Northern California counties and also ones that are around Los Angeles. What is happening there? You're seeing an aging population and also potentially lower levels of population. Tricky for workforce development. So generally speaking, the forecast is good. We have some challenges coming up over the next few years across California and really across the United States. But here's some things to watch. Geopolitics and American politics. I didn't even talk about what's going on in Ukraine, China and Taiwan. A lot of that saber rattling is, is classic and how it starts to affect the, uh, the economy will depend A, how equity markets read those signals and B, whether or not a shooting war starts. But we're watching that a little bit more closely as well as our own internal politics, which seem crazier than ever. Watching inflation and what the Federal Reserve is going to do. How fast will rates go up and how far? That's a key question for equity markets and also for housing markets over the next 12 months. 
Will pressure continue? So will those forecasts play out or how much are those forecasts dependent on, let's say two or three in rate increases by the Federal Reserve? Or does it matter? Because the Federal Reserve affects the short end of the market, not the long. And there's you know, 40, 50 years worth of debate about how changing rates on the short run, on the short term by central banks actually affect longer term rates like mortgages. Right now, they're very much linked to each other, at least for the time being. So watch that as the Fed starts to increase rates. And it's almost a guarantee the Fed is going to increase rates by at least two changes in 2022, maybe three or four, but think two for sure. Commercial real estate is what's going to happen in our urban markets. We have urban markets that have now two years of a lack of the same level of travel, the lack of the same level of consumers, the lack of the same utilization of commercial real estate. And just think, if your house was half occupied for two years, and really nobody was going there at all, you're going to have technology that's out of date. You're going to have systems that are not going to work as much anymore. You're going to have cleaning that you're going to need to do. There's just a lot of maintenance issues with real estate that's not utilized on a regular basis, though you do avoid some of the costs of use. Bottom line is there's concentric circles in our urban areas specifically that need to watch what happens if we don't come back to work in full. This is also true for, for travel. So travel in California, we've had a lot of indigenous travel people moving around California. We had a little bit more of a pickup in the summer 2021. We need to continue that momentum to continue to have job growth in those industries that still remain way down from when uh, the recession began. Those last few slides, got to watch for, for demographic change and what that means for our regional economies, especially those that are starting to lose population and what that means in terms of not only lost population, but also of an aging population and how we view economic development in face of all those forecasts and what might be happening with our workforce, especially for small suburban and rural California, who's come and brought a job with them? What's that mean for our local areas and what do rising house prices mean for jobs in uh, in everywhere in California with respect to uh, what types of businesses we should really be thinking about growing and retaining. So folks, thanks for attending. I'll hand it back to you, Vicki. Thanks so much. Yes, there will be a recording sent to everybody or at least a link set out to everybody. No worries there. Thank you folks again so much for coming. All right, thank you, Rob. That was uh, good information, a lot to digest there. I'm not seeing any questions right now, but, and as Rob said, both the uh, a PDF of the slides and a recording will be available on, um, at least on our website. And I can send out the link to those who have registered. Uh, we did have, unfortunately, a little change in the times so that may have been, uh, we may have missed a couple of people, but we will send out that link to everyone. Thank you all, and we'll look forward to the next uh, webinar. Good night.